how I got out of Zionism. So this is obviously a much longer conversation. This is a really good video. Story. But for the sake of brevity. This person is a, is a settler too. Like I think he was in the West Bank as well. So in 2018, when I was 20 years old, I was studying in Jerusalem in an all-male religious nationalist seminary. And obviously I grew up very Zionist. And while I was there, I started having questions about the entire population that existed beyond these walls. And as part of my program, there were individuals who were doing this interesting program where folks actually met Palestinians and heard some of their perspectives. And for me, I had heard some good things about that program and some of the things that they were saying were interesting and appealing, so I decided to go to that program. And I remember it was a Friday before Shabbos, and I was sitting there at 9 a.m. in Jerusalem, and a Palestinian man had come to speak to us. And he was describing how he had to get up at 4.30 a.m. to make it to Jerusalem at 9 a.m., even though he lived in Ramallah, which is only like seven miles away. So obviously my brain goes, well, that doesn't make any sense. Surely it shouldn't take you more than four hours to go seven miles. And then I listened how he proceeded to talk about the system of checkpoints, how he had to get on a separate bus, how he had to make the calculation of whether it made more sense for him to stay on the bus, knowing that if he's on the bus, he could be kicked off the bus at the checkpoint and go to the back of the line, or if it just made sense to just wait on the non-bus part of the checkpoint to get through to make sure that he got here in time, to speak to a bunch of Zionist Jews to try to convince them that Palestinians were human. So after the lecture, I went up to him. I was like, dude, this is f***ed up. What is going <laughs> That's so, I'm sorry. I know this is a serious story, but it is. It's so f***ed up that it's like, if you person to person have a guy describe this to you, you should only, that should be your response. You're like, what the f***? And this guy lives there, chat. What's going on here? Why did no one tell me about this? And I was like, can you just like, I didn't even know what to, I was like, can you like, more, just more. Tell me more. He took out his ID card and he's like, yeah, I actually have to head back now because if I'm not back by a certain time, my provisional travel status is going to get revoked and I won't be able to leave Ramallah again. And it doesn't matter if the checkpoints held me up and the checkpoints could take three to four hours. I need to head back now. I'm like, dude, it's, it's 1030 or 11 o'clock. He's like, I can't take any chances. Like I, I'm not risking this getting revoked. So I said to him, I was like, I need to know more. He said, well, why don't you come with me to Ramallah? So I'll tell you, the first thought that rose in my mind, it was rising and it said, if I go, you will kill me. Because that was the way I was conditioned. Growing up, for me, Palestinians were terrorists. There was no possibility that a Palestinian was human and certainly no possibility that Palestinian resistance had nothing to do with Jewish folks, but had to do with the fact that there were settlers kicking Palestinians off their land, upholding apartheid, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. So as that thought was rising, there was another voice in me. And I think this voice is a deep ancestral voice. And to this day, I'm amazed at myself that in, I was able to challenge all of my conditioning with the second voice, a, a deeper voice. For the record, that is important. Many people don't do that. A lot of people that come in here and immediately f start yelling and saying things like, Hassan, you're anti-Semitic or whatever. What you're saying must be untrue. They're saying that because there is a secondary voice inside of their heart that says, if what you are saying is true about Israel, then everything I know is wrong. And that's really f***ed up. Like that the country that I've been defending for all these years is actually doing really f***ed up so there's always that other voice inside of you that is creating cognitive dissonance because if you were a stupid person simply just a stupid person then you wouldn't even be mad because the real stupid person comes in here and goes get f***ed bozo israel on top palestinians are goat f***ers the person with at least some semblance of conscience comes in here and is misguided and maybe even cynical but at least like there's a mashup of these two different conflicting opinions inside of your brain because the real dumb is they come in here all the time. They, they come in here and they talk about like genocide is awesome. Let's go pog. Okay. But there are at least people with like some semblance of consciousness and they are having a hard time 
with the cognitive biases that they have, with the with the cognitive dissonance that they are experiencing. So the only thing that they can do is probably try to re-solidify and reaffirm their position. And instead of looking within and going, wait, maybe what he's saying, I'm, I should listen to charitably. They go, I am going to suppress what my conscience is telling me because I value myself to be a progressive. And what this guy, this guy that I may have even trusted in the past, who I've thought to be a progressive in the past, is now telling me something that goes against my beliefs, my conditioning that has told me that what Israel is doing is just. These are national security concerns. These are real concerns. I always want you to remember, if you come in here with that with that kind of uh, attitude, just examine deep within, inside of yourself, beyond the security concerns that you've been told, beyond the necessity for the apartheid to exist. Instead of having that knee-jerk reaction, what you should do is listen to that other voice inside of you that says, what if this stuff is true? What if what I am hearing, albeit biased, is not untrue? What if it is true? And then you should go on a journey. Once you ask that question inside of yourself, you have to go on a journey. You can't just take my word for it. Because I meme sometimes, I have angry moments, sometimes it's clippable sh I am simply here as a shepherd to guide you on the right path. I am not your savior. I am not a smart guy. I'm a dumb guy. You have to then go and do the reading. Look it up. A lot of the stuff that I talk about is readily available. Just confirm or deny by searching the things that I have brought up from joking stuff that sounds ridiculous, like the Israeli cum retrieval, all the way to why I say Israel is an apartheid state. Go to B'Tselem, go to the Human Rights Watch, go to Amnesty International, go and read why these people have laid out with the specifics, why these organizations, both Israeli and international organizations, have laid out with the specifics what Israel is doing is unacceptable. Why? That's it. Because I think that if you do that, and if you are genuinely charitable, instead of trying to hide under the comfort of reaffirming the patriotic conditioning that you have been subjected to your whole life, and that does seem very comfortable, there is there's comfort there. There's a sense of security there, right? And there are plenty of people who are just as progressive as you are who will also reaffirm your suspicions that maybe the naysayers are wrong. Maybe people that are pro-Palestinian are actually wrong. It's just something to consider. And that voice immediately said, well, you've been told your whole life that this person was going to kill you and that this person was a terrorist and he wasn't human. And he's standing right in front of you and he's the exact opposite of those things. In that moment, I didn't vocalize that thought, and I called bullshit, and I said, yeah, I'll come. I'll come. I need to see it for myself. And I went to Shar Shem, which is Damascus Gate, the only place I wasn't allowed to go to when I was in yeshiva, for fear that Palestinians would kill me. And the second I stepped into Damascus Gate, I essentially, I, I don't want to say became Palestinian, that's ridiculous. I had tremendous privilege as a settler, but I got to taste, maybe instead of a drop in the ocean, I got to taste the mist surrounding one drop in the ocean of what it's like to be subject to a settler colonial regime. And I got on a Palestinian bus, and for me, I was like, well, this is interesting that it's a completely different busing system. But even more than that, it's like I all of a sudden was with the people who were supposed to kill me. And in fact, the very opposite happened, where when I was on a Palestinian bus, all of a sudden my sense of identity and belonging started to become Palestinian in terms of my sense of where my safety lies. Huh. And my sense of threat immediately became whole. Yeah, he realized, this is, this is something that I mentioned all the time too. Like, people, my mother are like, why don't you go to Gaza? Like, why don't you go to Gaza and say that? And it's like, Bitch, I'm not afraid of Hamas in Gaza. I'm afraid of the IDF. The reason why I can't go to Gaza right now is not because of Hamas. Like, they say this all the time, but with, like, Clarissa Ward, right? Like, they'll be like, why doesn't Clarissa Ward go to Gaza? She has! And she wasn't murdered. You want to know why? Because she's a media person. These people are not, like, violent, bloodthirsty monsters who are just like, oh, this is a white woman. Time to kill her. No. Clarissa Ward in Gaza is under threat. Not by Hamas, but by the IDF. Okay? I'm on a Palestinian bus. I am being read as Palestinian in a genocidal settler colony. I am about to go through an hour and a half of military checkpoints in knowing that this occupying army can do whatever they want to me. And the only protection I have is an American passport, which is way more than any Palestinian has. And I was still terrified. And I remember the process of just like this image of a Palestinian father being comforted by his daughter. This man's probably 65 years old. And just me just realizing in that moment, like, 
the deep humiliation that this person had to undergo. And he was someone privileged who was able to leave Ramallah to Jerusalem. And I remember just going through the Columbia checkpoint, IDF soldiers coming on, harassing us. And I remember going into the Columbia checkpoint and being on the inside of the wall and seeing the beautiful graffiti and seeing that there was a, a graffiti of someone, a kid with a slingshot. And my Jewish brain at the time said, wow, this is amazing. The Quran and the Torah are so similar. They also have an image of King David with a slingshot. Oh, that's so powerful. I hadn't seen this part. Bro, oh my God. That's so true. King David is like David and Goliath, and yet it's vilified. It's vilified when the Palestinian kids do it. And then after that, the bus kept going, and the slingshot was pointed at an IDF soldier. And that's when it started to crumble for me, where I said, wait a second, who's who here? Who's David no and who's Goliath? way, that's a good-ass take. These are the same rocks that my ancestors used to resist oppression. And now these rocks of... King David is like canonically the goaded story right it's the it's overcoming it's overcoming a a, a great evil much larger uh, overcoming uh, I- impressive odds impossible odds it's like the underdog story okay great veggie tales episode Sure. And it is like, it's something that obviously a lot of uh, Jews internalize. It's something that also corresponds almost perfectly to uh, Jewish history as Jews have been the underdogs historically, right? The minority group in every population constantly being cast aside, constantly being purged, constantly being made out uh, to be the villains. So like, it's, it's definitely a story that is uh, understandably important. And it, it is a, it's, it's definitely powerful because like in that moment, you're not the underdog. To come to that recognition uh, through, through powerful imagery, it's, it's great. Palestine are being used by Palestinians to resist oppression too. And we have become our worst nightmare. I remember sitting in a bar in Ramallah, this person just explaining to me, this beautiful Palestinian human just explaining to me, being so patient with me, speaking to a Zionist settler, speaking to me and just saying like, dude, like most people here have never seen Jerusalem. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's literally right there. It's like you have to be a male and 65 or older or women 55 or older, or you need to have someone sponsor you for a work permit. But the only way they can sponsor you, there has to be an Israeli. And how the fuck is an Israeli going to sponsor you if they don't even know you exist because you're behind the wall? Again, maybe the regulations have changed. This was my experience five years ago. It's probably gotten worse. And I remember him saying to me, He says, Shlomo, what would you do? What would you do if your entire life, the only person of the occupying army that you saw and the only interaction you ever had with Jews were IDF soldiers who came in and raided you and arrested you in the middle of the night, put you under administrative detention, tear gassed your homes, cut off your water and electricity, arrested a bunch of your friends and killed you and harassed you. He said, what would you do? And I said, if you don't think that I would resist with every single fiber in my being as long as I was alive to liberate myself from this colonial hell? You are out of your mind. I said, how dare you even ask me what I would do? I said, do you know my ancestry? Do you know who I come from? Do you know that my lineage? I had, my grandfather survived Auschwitz. Rib Shimon Bar Yochai, Hanukkah, you think I wouldn't fight back? That was after six hours. Can you imagine what 18 years, what 30 years does to the psyche of someone like that? And y'all sit here and get confused with Palestinian resistance? Are you kidding me? All that shows me is that A, you have no idea what the settler colony of Israel is, and B, it's disrespectful. You're disrespecting yourself because you're telling me that if you were in that position, you wouldn't fight back and you would willingly die. And that tells me that if I was in Auschwitz with you and we were in the bunkers, you wouldn't resist our Nazi captors. And that is someone I don't trust. So let's get it together and start telling the truth and take this seriously. Let's free Palestine for all people, for all people, everyone on the land. So as powerful words, I, I hadn't watched the whole thing. It's it's actually incredible. The thing I will say is this: a lot of people, a lot of people come to me and say, you know, uh, isn't it mind boggling or mind numbing that people willingly misunderstand what you have to say? It's mind boggling. Isn't it angering? 
anger inducing that people deliberately say things like oh you must be a Russia supporter or you're this you're that people clip chimp you and uh, take you out of context constantly uh, talk about you know how hypocritical it is that you're socialist but rich and Part of the reason why my values are not shook is, well, twofold. One, because I do think that justice is always inevitable. There is an inevitability towards justice and that people will inevitably come around. And two, my conscience is clear. That's it. My conscience is clear. I know I'm on the right side of history. I know that my morals are strong. My moral compass is just. My moral compass is in the right direction. And I know that I will do my very best in the short period of time that I have on this earth to fight for the things I believe believe in. I will do it with honesty. And ultimately, it doesn't matter. I'm a very stubborn person. So do the Christians, man. Come on. What? Christians? Christians. Or anyone else for that matter. But that's something you should remind yourself as well. That ultimately, there will be a lot of naysayers. There will be a lot of people who try to and put you down. Many of them don't even do it on like the boundaries of ideology. They will come in and be like, I'm pro-Palestine, by the way, but also I think you're Saying Christians believe they have a strong moral compass and know they're on the right side of history too. Yeah, well, they're wrong. Because ultimately there are inherent biases that many Christians usually try to, to, to cut out instead of thinking about it. The greatest example I can give you is that if you are a Christian and there are plenty of ecumenical Marxists out there, how the f*** are you not a socialist? When you know, and I know this is like a comical thing to even repeat, it's a cliche at this point, that Jesus Christ, okay, as a historical figure, was a f brown palestinian communist okay so any anything that you're advocating for that is against those values is in need of constant reinforcement you have to constantly f turn around and and go against the values that you've read up on do you understand yes of course people think that their cause is just and they're on the right side and they have the right morals or whatever but there are still always going to be internal contradictions i am constantly engaging in self-criticism which is a way for me to shake such internal contradictions and i'm i'm demanding you do it too i'm telling you it's hard it's not an easy thing to do but if you do it you will recognize that you do have some cognitive dissonance inside of you i agree i was just saying that that dude was trying to say that the word believe was doing some heavy lifting in that sentence okay not believe i know how about that i am armed with the knowledge that what i am advocating for is ultimately a good thing a just thing I never have to worry about, I guess, um, the, the, the other side of freedom. You know what I mean? You advocate for freedom. You advocate for emancipation for all peoples. There is no situation there where you could go wrong.